again, want to welcome uh, everyone uh, and thank you guys for joining us tonight for our uh, virtual uh, horse uh, showmanship clinic. This is our fifth uh, showmanship, uh, virtual showmanship clinic that we've done uh, over the last uh, five weeks. Uh, we got uh, three more clinics uh, scheduled over the next three weeks that'll take us through the end of May. And those clinics uh, will be posted here shortly in the chat box if you uh, miss those. And uh, as you can see, the first uh, slide here that um, we that ha that you have in front of us lists the committee members that have uh, brought this virtual life uh, showmanship uh, clinic series to you uh, to you guys. Uh, we have Mr. Rick Schmidt. Uh, he's an extension agent down in Western North Dakota in Oliver County. Uh, Mr. Kurt Freilich. He will be uh, watching the chat box tonight and. Uh, answering some of those questions via chat. He will also be recording some of those questions. And when we get to the end, we'll be, or those questions directly to Dr. Skirpe uh, uh, for her to answer those questions uh, throughout the evening. Uh, Kurt also serves as a extension agent out in Western North Dakota in the Stark Billings County area. Uh, Lindsay Maddock, an extension agent out in the middle of North Dakota in Wells County. Uh, my name is Brian Zemprick. I serve as a extension agent in Ransom County in southeastern North Dakota. Uh, Sarah McNaughton uh, serves as an extension agent in Cass County, uh, which butts up uh, to Minnesota. Uh, Paige Brumman is on and will be assisting Dr. Skirpe tonight in the uh, horse Showmanship uh, Clinic. She serves as an extension agent up in Ward County, up in uh, North Central North Dakota. Emily Goff uh, shares an office with Paige, also in Ward County. Emily serves as a 4-H youth development agent up in Ward County. Dr. Travis Hoffman uh, serves as our NDSU Extension Sheep uh, Specialist. Uh, and he is on and I believe will be also monitoring chat boxes tonight. And our uh, leader, uh, Dr. Leanne Scarpe, uh, she serves as our 4-H uh, Youth Development Specialist in the Animal Science area, uh, covering uh, livestock and equine sciences. And Dr. Scarpe is going to be um, presenting uh, the uh, showmanship clinic tonight. Okay, so as Dr. Skirpe launched that uh, other poll, we're gonna talk here uh, about our objective slide and this kind of lays out the format of what uh, we're gonna go through tonight. Uh, the format of this is an eight part series, a virtual showmanship clinic uh, kind of helps us uh, in this time of COVID-19, we need to figure out new ways of teaching and learning, and this is one opportunity that uh, we could do. Um, uh, an opportunity to give you some tips and tricks and also have some fun. Uh, we are excited that you're able to join us tonight as we cover the equine showmanship, uh, virtual showmanship clinic. Uh, Dr. Skirpe is going to go through and list some uh, tips and uh, training as well as grooming of your equine projects. Uh, she's going to show some videos to uh, further describe and analyze uh, some showmen. Uh, the showmanship series is being recorded and posted on the North Dakota 4-H Livestock Events page and she will share a link to this presentation there. Uh, let's see, we will touch on show showmanship etiquette uh, and how to handle and lead your animals during while you're in a show. Uh, Dr. Skirpe will talk a bit about you as the exhibitor and she will finish with some questions and answers at the end of the... Uh, uh, so without further ado, I want to introduce Dr. Skirpe. Uh, Dr. Skirpe, like I said, is our leader of the Animal Science 4-H group, uh, Livestock and Equine uh, group here in North Dakota. Uh, she is going to lead our equine uh, showmanship clinic. Uh, Dr. Skirpe, 
Pay is a professionally carded judge with the American Paint Horse Association, the Pinto Horse Association of, of America, and the American Stock Horse Association. Uh, so at this time, I am going to turn the mic over to Dr. Scarpe and let her uh, start her presentation. As I said, I will post a couple links to Facebook pages and other showmanship videos into the chat box here uh, as Dr. Scarpe starts her presentation. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Brian, for that wonderful introduction and getting the ball rolling. Pretty excited to see quite a few uh, variation on here. That is pretty neat that we have so many joining in on here on this call tonight. Um, I have one more poll just because I'm curious uh, who is here in terms of experience. And so I am kind of want to know where you're at right now. If you were to do today as your, your current time and showmanship for the equine species, well, let's see where you guys are at. As you guys are moving through that poll, I'm going to go ahead and kind of give you a rundown of what's going to happen. First, I have to thank all of my incredible people that have allowed me to have their videos or their photos. Uh, certainly couldn't do this presentation without them, so very grateful for your talents. And the individual photos, um, super rock stars that I'm showing you tonight, just know that that photo may have been taken at a very in a, inconvenient time or perhaps they were practicing. So nothing against any of the exhibitors in these photos tonight. They are all doing a, a fantastic job. So pretty exciting. We actually have some 33% um, so far in terms of over four years of showing. That's exciting. Um, I'm hoping that you guys can still take home something tonight, which I'm certain that you will. And, and learn some good stuff. We're going to cover, we're going to start from the basics uh, for, it looks like we've got 21% that are, is our first year here, which is super exciting. And we're going to start with nutrition. We're going to cover equipment. We're going to go over your appearance and your horse's appearance and the body position of each. We're going to show a couple examples of videos, especially when we get to maneuvers and penalties. And so we will cover those as well. And then we're going to talk a little bit about you as an exhibitor and we'll follow up with some questions and answers and just like Brian said shoot those into the chat box they're going to be recording those so if you're typing in there and you're not getting an answer right away that's okay we're going to make sure that we get those answered a little bit later on during the presentation so I'm going to go ahead and end that poll thank you guys so much for um, participating in those polls those really are valuable I'll have one later on um, throughout this presentation as well and I've stopped sharing my video. I'll share it later on when we get to questions, just to make sure that my quality on my side for videos is good. All right, so let's get started. Nutrition. Proper nutrition is not only good for your horse, but will help your horse shine and make their body coat that much easier to clean before show day. Brian's gonna share a link with you in terms of body condition score or BCS. And that is a perfect link to save for a later date to go on and learn about that. You really need to know and understand what BCS is. You need to know the areas to focus on for the body condition score and then go out and actually evaluate your own horse and assign a body condition score to your horse. You can see off to the right, that picture shows you the six areas to focus on, on the equine body. And that's a system designed to assess the relative body fat with your hands and your eyes. And so definitely jump on and learn more about that. It's really critical to maintaining the nutrition of your horse. Consult uh, an extension agent or a local feed store, or perhaps a veterinarian to develop a nutrition plan if you don't already have one, because that is key to keeping your horse healthy. Something that is very key for you as an exhibitor and a horse owner is knowing how to read your feed tag. Um, knowing how much to feed your horse per day and, and weigh out your feed, not just say, oh, I'm feeding a scoop. Well, how much does that scoop weigh? Because that's gonna be really critical to knowing how much your horse is consuming. 
quality of forage and hay is absolutely imperative. We want to feed them good quality hay that is free of any mold or dust. And you should feed about 1.5 to 2.5% of your body weight. So it's good to know how to learn how to weigh your horse. You don't actually need a weight scale. You can certainly Google and find out how to do and use a weight tape. So for example, about a thousand pound horse in light work can consume about 20 pounds of forage a day. So notice again, it's pounds, so it's a weight. It's really critical to weigh your horse's feed. A salt in the middle brock is certainly imperative for your horse's nutrition. We wanna make sure that they're getting those proper supplements, whether that be as a block, or it can certainly be as a free choice mineral supplement as well. Or maybe you're adding it on top of their grain, which is perfectly fine as well. Do you have to feed grain? Absolutely not, it is not required. Really the grain is there to meet your horse's energy needs. And so making sure that you're feeding quality grain is great, especially if your horse needs it. That again goes with body condition score. And above all, provide plenty, plenty, plenty of clean, fresh water. All right. What kind of equipment are we going to need for the showmanship shindig? I'm going to start at the top with the clippers and I'm going to work my way around. So you don't have to have a set of clippers. It just makes your horse look pretty. Is it required that you actually clip your horse? Absolutely not. Usually when we do clip a horse, we're going to clip the muzzle and we're going to clip the ears. You don't have to clip inside the ears. You can fold the ears and just trim the outside so the tufts of hair don't stick out. That's perfectly fine. Oftentimes we'll trim the legs depending on um, what you've got going on. Just be careful not to trim them very short, especially if they've got white and you're outside a lot. You want to make sure they're not going to sunburn. So if you, your horse is in the barn a lot, perfectly fine. If they're outside a lot, just be careful. And you'll end up trimming um, the fetlock area and certainly around the cornet band and there's uh, other articles out there that can help you identify proper proper clipping methods. You can clip the bridle path and a little bit under the jaw as well. Brushes. All equestrians have an assortment of brushes, lots of different kinds. So I've got a very thick bristled one pictured here. Um, this one is going to be a lot more harder, so it's going to get off those big clumps of mud and such. And then I have a finer bristled one, which is going to get um, really nice and, and get all the dust and stuff off that horse. I really like the rubber made one too. I really prefer this one when I'm scrubbing my horse and giving it a bath. And you got a mane comb. You don't have to have these exact ones. Maybe you've got some different ones. Maybe yours are prettier. Perfectly fine. You're gonna need a hoof pick. We need to make sure that every time you use your horse, you need to clean out its feet. Not only does that allow you to expect, inspect their feet, but it allows you to make sure you're inspecting the inside of the foot as well, checking for bruises, any sort of thrush or bacteria problems, any sort of rocks or foreign objects. You're gonna need a rag of some sort to wipe off that nose. As we all know, it collects a lot of dust. And so we wanna make sure that we wipe them off and make them look really clean when we're going into showmanship. These two products, Baby Powder and Face Glow, you don't have to use these. They are just some fun things to add to make your horse look nice and shiny. Uh, Face Glow is preferred because it has vitamin E and it actually contains some sunscreen and aloe. You can certainly use any sort of petroleum gel, baby oil, and such just if you use those products you have to be really careful to wipe them off if they're going out in the sun because not only can a horse get irritated to some of the petroleum jellies but it can also cause sunburn so just be careful baby powder is really just used if you got some white feet on your horse it's fun to make it really stand out in really bright white just to add some of that baby powder really freshen up the white you're going to need some halters you can have your nice nylon halter for training and a show halter and lead for showmanship. Do you have to have something super fancy all blinged out with silver? Absolutely not. This is not a fashion contest. So anything will work. Got to need some fly spray. We all know that horses are bothered by these little pesky things. So we're going to need those, especially when it comes to inspection time, because they're going to get a penalty if they stomp their feet for those little lovely gems. A bag of some sort or box or 
something, a tote is always nice, just to tote it around and carry all of your materials. Maybe you wanna do some shoe polish. You don't have to for the hooves to make them really gloss and shine, becoming black and clear. Um, if your horse's foot is naturally black, you would do it black. If it's white, you're gonna use the, the clear. Um, you don't have to though. If you wanna just make sure you knock off the mud and it, they're nice and clean, that is absolutely perfectly fine. And then we have a blower here in the center. Do you need a blower? No, you don't need a blower. But it's a nice way to um, get your horse desensitized to one more thing. And then also uh, it'll dry them off a lot faster. Some other things that aren't pictured here, you're gonna need a bucket for water. I prefer two with bucket hangers, hay and hay net, a feed bucket. You might do two as well in case one breaks. A hose, because you can't always assume that the place or the facilities that you guys are going to go to will actually have a hose. I prefer the ones that have the nice spray nozzle ends. That way you can adjust what's going on and leave the water turned on while you're washing off your horse. And then shampoo and conditioner. Maybe you've got some shiny stuff you want to do for hair as well. I really also want to advocate that when you go to shows and when you're coming home, you always need to practice good biosecurity. Don't share your supplies or your buckets with other people that you don't know because you don't know where those horses have been and you're only making an assumption that they're healthy. So their clinical signs might not be exhibited. So really make sure you look into what biosecurity is um, and put it practice a plan and put it together for you. It's really critical. All right, what else can we talk about? This is really important, your horse. You do not need an expensive showmanship horse. You do, however, need a horse that is well-trained and you can do that. You have to be able to hand a horse safely on the ground. It's an integral part of owning a horse. A horse without grand manners is likely to be pretty disrespectful when you climb on its back. So that's why it's important. Showmanship is not judged on the most expensive outfit or the fanciest halter. The rule book simply calls for neat attire and a well-groomed horse. In our case here in North Dakota, you must be in 4-H attire and we'll go over that a little later. Again, always read your rule book because you're going to find out what your expectations are for your show you're attending. Healthy and fit means a balanced ration with enough protein, vitamins, and mineral, a regular deworming schedule, and exercise regularly. What you absolutely need is a good work ethic and time to practice and practice some more. You also need a rule book. You're gonna hear me say that a lot. A rule book is key. So no matter what, you really need to go back to the rule book to learn what is expected of you. All right, we're gonna start here. A properly turned out horse begins with properly fitted tack. Because your only equipment in the class is your halter, it should be clean and fit properly. Looking at your horse on the left, the nose band should fit halfway between the eyes and the muzzles and right below your horse's cheekbone, indicated by the white and the orange arrow. So you can see right here on the nose band following my red um, highlighter. And then right here on the cheekbone, it's nicely snug up against there with that orange yellow arrow. The cheek pieces, should be snug without extra space between them and the horse's jaw, indicated by the blue arrows. And so you can see that this cheek piece fits this particular horse really nicely. It's not super long. And then as a result, it fits nicely snug up through the throat latch and up through over the pole. The lead shank should run through the left ring on the halter and under the horse's jaw through the lower right ring and snap on the upper right ring of the halter. And I'll show you that here in a minute. That's indicated by the pink arrows on the left picture. It is industry standard to go below the jaw rather than over the nose. So let's compare the two. If the horse is on the right, let's look at his nose band. It is super low on his set nose here, not halfway between the eyes and muzzle, which then creates a pretty big gap right here with this orange arrow falling below his cheekbone. And then subsequently, it's then a sag up here on his halter for the cheek up here. So again, it really puts a nice presentation together when we have a nicely fitted halter. So let's ensure that we're, we're fitting those halters properly. So what about that darn chain? 
The presentation of the chain is much neater and professional when clipped directly to the ring underneath the horse's right eye, when the clip is facing out, indicated by the red arrow. The clip facing out helps to ensure that it doesn't accidentally come open or unclipped or even rub your horse's cheek. You can run it through the ring and double it back as indicated over here by the pink arrow and the pink um, highlighted uh, picture over to the right. It is simply not a preferred method. It is better to have your shank cut down to the correct size as an excessive amount of chain can be distracting. But if that's all you have and you need to double it back like that, that is okay. Never ever loop the chain around the horse's nose and clip it back to itself as seen in the top left picture. So right up here, we don't wanna do this. Never run the chain through the side of the ring and clip it back to the lead as seen in the top right photo. So right over here. This is not a safe practice and it doesn't provide good control over your horse. For safety reasons, never ever hold on to the actual chain with your hand. All right, appearance, what are we looking at? Well, let's start with the bath. Renting your horse is a great thing. It's gonna take off some of that dead hair, dead skin and stimulate growth. A mild soap can be used. There's lots of them out there to use. Just make sure you rinse your body of your horse off very well. We don't wanna dry out their skin or cause dandruff. Or, you know, rinsing too much can remove oil. So there's plenty of products out there that you can recondition them and utilize well. Trimming, you always wanna make sure they're correctly trimmed and shod. A farrier is key to making sure that those angles are correct and reduce the likelihood of any sort of lameness. Ideally, every six weeks, you're gonna to need to trim your horse. Some horses are different, some need it sooner, some can go a little longer. You know your horse best. A hat needs to be well-shaped, it needs to be clean. If you're wearing a helmet, same thing, needs to be clean. I want that fastened, um, underneath your chin very well and tight. It shouldn't be dangling if you're wearing that helmet. Your hair needs to be controlled, whether female or male, and be neat in a ponytail or bun if it's too long to tuck up under your hat. You'll notice with the pink arrow that this beautiful lady, it's just a little wild right now. I'd rather that see, be seen in a more proper bun. So go ahead and you can buy like even a, a colored hairnet from um, state line tack or drover salary and wrap that uh, hairnet that matches the color of your hair around that and pin it up and it looks very nice and professional. Get those little stragglers out of the way. Your curling needs to be nicely fitted. Pants should be long enough to come just above the heels of your boots. You don't want them too wrong because you don't want to trip on your, your pants when you're, you're running. Fancy clothes does not gain bonus points. So just because uh, you got rhinestones and stuff on your clothes, yes, it looks beautiful, but that's not what this class is judged on. Absolutely no spurs. We don't want to trip over ourselves um, or cause an unsafe situation. So spurs are specifically disallowed in North Dakota. Uh, so don't walk in, just don't go in with your spurs on. However, your boots do need to be shine and they need to be clean. Are they going to get dirty? Probably. Sure, they probably will, but they need to be clean to start out with. You should always dress to impress. You are basically going in like you're going into a job interview. I always tell my clients to basically, this is gonna sound silly, but go in like you're carrying a cookie sheet and you don't want your cookies to fall off your cookie sheet. And so you're gonna carry that cookie sheet through every single gate. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that. You never change your form from any transition of any gate. So what actually is showmanship? This is gonna be a mouthful, but hang in there with me. It's basically a dance between the horse and the exhibitor. We need to be poised, confident, neatly attired, leading a well-groomed and conditioned horse that correctly and efficiently performs the prescribed maneuvers with promptness, cadence, rhythm, smoothness, precision, while maintaining a balanced, functional, and fundamentally correct body position. Holy cow, that's a mouthful. What does that all mean? Well, let me break down some of that for you. First, I want to talk about these two very, very important words. If you don't know what these are, 
let me teach you because this doesn't just pertain to showmanship, this pertains to every single class you exhibit in. First, you got cadence. Cadence is the accuracy of the footfall pattern. So your feet and your horse's feet at any given gait. So your walk is a four beat, your trot is a two beat. We're not gonna lope here, but a lope is a three beat or a canter, three beat. And then you got your rhythm. Your rhythm is the consistency and speed or pace of those footfall patterns at any given gait. So for example, if it's supposed to start off that pattern at the trot, and I start off and I'm like one, two, 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 one, two. I was not consistent in my rhythm. I need to be very consistent in my cadence throughout the entire pattern in every single gait, whether you're a walk or a jog or a trot or extended trot. Very important. So we're gonna kind of start off here. I'm gonna move this in here because um, that video was not very clean when I actually was, was watching it. I apologize if there's any fuzziness on your end for the video quality. Once you come back and rewatch this, it is being recorded, it'll be much clearer. So that vis vision and the, the fuzziness is perhaps your bandwidth and our, our internet craziness. So let's build on these words that I just talked about uh, with an exceptional run to get your eyes and mind thinking of what is super high quality. Do you need to be exactly like this exhibitor to win? Absolutely not. That is However, knowing what is exceptional gives you something to work towards. So let's listen to Tina Anderson talk through her judge's perspective. And I highly re recommend you watching these free judges perspectives for any class because they're great learning tools. So let's see what Tina's gonna say. The showmanship winner in the 14 to 18 was a unanimous decision. This is just a brilliant showman who does a very accurate pattern, but with so much style and grace. Her first trot in is at a good pace. It's a very straight line. She stops good and hard. And then she maneuvers into one of the best backs we've seen in a long time. This horse keeps a very straight line through his spine. She backs equally on each side of the corner. She then turns around and has just a great pleasant expression at a very forward, purposeful walk. Moves into her 360, stays equal distance away from her horse throughout the turn. He's very straight in his spine and then moves into an extended trot circle. And although this exhibitor is not a tall girl, she does move out very nicely. Her horse is very much in rhythm with her. And at the close of the circle, immediately moves down to a regular trot. Stops, hesitates, and moves into her big turn. I really appreciate the way that this exhibitor hesitates before each maneuver, showing total control of her horse. This horse is not a fast turning horse, but he's very accurate and stays very straight through his spine. And she stays an equal distance away from her horse through the whole time. Can't ask for a better setup. I know all of us discussed after the class that this was just a plus plus maneuver, showing that she has the ability to show this horse at halter. So much style and presence in her inspection. And again, another excellent backup good pace, very straight through his spine, and she has total control of her horse throughout the whole pattern. The horse has a beautiful expression, nothing is overdone, just so much grace and style. All right, just some really great words of wisdom from Tina. She identified some exceptional key points in the maneuvers. And so let's kind of start to break some of that down as we walk through what on earth a judge is looking for and some of the expectations for our showing. As an exhibitor, it's very critical you are familiar with the rule book. Yes, I'm saying it again. Every class you show in, not just showmanship. This will not only help you as an exhibitor understand what us as judges are looking for in you and your horse, it will also help you know what are the faults and what are the possible penalties that you can incur in that particular pattern. So hopefully you can try to minimize those. 
For this class, we do parallel the standards set forth by AQHA for North Dakota. However, read your rule book to know what your association or your show is expecting because not all rule books are the same. So please, again, at this time, we're gonna tell you a little bit how showmanship is scored. So showmanship is based on zero to infinity with 70 denoting the average performance. What does that mean? That means that as soon as the judge nods his head for you as an exhibitor to go on pattern, you have a score of 70. Each maneuver from then that you perform will be subtracted or added from that 70. Each maneuver located over here, I'm describing, has a maneuver score of plus three, which is excellent. We really want lots of those, all the way down to minus three, which is extremely poor we need to work on back at home. And they can be in half point increments. So maybe you get a plus one and a half. That is perfectly fine. For form and effectiveness over here to the right, this evaluates your entire run. So not just one specific maneuver. As you complete your pattern, you tell the judge a story of your overall body position, your precision and effectiveness with your horse working together as a team. Your F and E is on a range of zero to five, with five being excellent, and zero going back down to average. What I want you to keep in mind for any class you show, and as you complete and we work through this showmanship, is ask yourself three things. These, these words are important. So start with correct. Was my pattern correct? Was my maneuver correct? Was my gait correct? That is super key. Then ask yourself, what was the quality of it? What was the quality of the run? What was the quality of the maneuver? What was the quality of the gait? And lastly, your degree of difficulty. What was my degree of difficulty? How can I perhaps sharpen it up or do something different to get a higher score? Maybe I got a plus one. What do I need to add degree of difficulty to to get it to a plus three? So let's move on to something that you guys should start to become familiar with, the scary thing. This is what the judges use to score you. It can be very confusing if you've never seen one of these things, so bear with me. I know there's a lot on here. As an exhibitor, I would highly recommend that you go and look at your score sheet when the judge posts them. This is a perfect opportunity for you to learn where you might have made your mistakes and fail forward. Maintain a positive attitude at all times and look only to an opportunity to grow. Don't walk up, see these negative reds and penalties on here and stomp your feet and walk away. That is not what we do um, because we are mentors and other people are watching you. Remember to be courteous in sportsmanship at all times. So let me break this down for you just to give you a better idea what we're looking at. So you're gonna have each maneuver listed out. So whatever maneuver your pattern is. So that's located here in blue. I've got all of my maneuvers as a judge listed across the top. And you might see some random numbers marked in here. Hopefully that judge has randomized and put them in tie-breaking order if you see that. Uh, they're supposed to do that before they even um, go in and start placing the class. That way there's no bias and they can have those tie-breakers on there before the class even starts. Your entry number is gonna be over here to the left. I've got it in blue. That's where you're gonna find your back number. So if you're 222, two, two, you would go down the score sheet because there might be several score sheets for your class. So you might have to search for that. We've got two rows here. I've got a top row with red numbers and I've got a bottom row with green numbers. This top row of red numbers, this is where your faults are gonna go or your penalties. So that's why I've got them in red because I'm gonna think of those as negative for now. This bottom row is every single maneuver score that you obtain for each maneuver. So this person got a plus half for its walk. It got a minus half and a three point penalty for its trot and just an average for its stop and, zero, and um, 90 degree turn. Something happened in the inspection. So if I don't know what 10 is, that means I can go back to the rule book and look up what are all of my 10 point faults so I can identify what on earth I did. We're going to go over those a little bit later, so don't worry. Over here, I've got the F and E. So remember, that's your overall form and effectiveness. That's the story of your entire pattern. 
And so because this exhibitor has quite a few negative items and some penalties, most likely it's gonna be low. This is just the total of your actual um, scores uh, for your penalties and then your overall scores. Sometimes they'll put comments in here, sometimes you don't see them, that's okay. Um, and then again, always talk through your, yourself. So was it correct? So why wasn't number two, the track correct? What could have I done in terms of quality to make it better? And what kind of degree of difficulty could have I added to that particular maneuver? All right, this is super key and I got, want you guys to remember this, okay? You can't dwell on your weaknesses. Just because you have one bad numer, maneuver doesn't mean you're discounted out of the class. That's what's cool about the new scoring system with the plus three to minus three. So don't dwell on what you don't do well and show off what you do well. Perhaps your backup got a little bit crooked towards the end, or maybe you forgot to do actual square corners and maybe your corners were just a little bit more round with a little bit of resistance. We all have weaknesses. Fail forward with a positive attitude and focus on the maneuvers that you can shine in. With practice, you can certainly improve on each one of those maneuvers, but it does require practice and a little bit of work. So don't forget that. All right, let's talk basic body positions. Hang in with me here. I know it's gonna be a lot of information. You can go back and really listen to this because it is recorded. The horse should move off your body motion, not your hand. Okay, we're gonna, I'm gonna say that a lot during this presentation. There should be little to no tension on your lead shank. It takes practice to get there, but I know you guys can do it. You have to be a natural showman. To begin, you should think about good natural posture. So let's talk through that. First, you got eyes up. Your eyes are looking to where you wanna go, planning to execute your pattern smoothly. Know exactly where your transitions are gonna take place, right down to the foot placement, of your horse and yourself, so you can nail those positions and those transitions with precision. Your arms, they're gonna hang naturally from your shoulders to form a L. Imagine you're holding that cookie sheet. Don't let those cookies fall off. This will help you keep your arms level and keep them from drifting, whether they drift towards your belly button or drift out to your sides. It'll also help you keep your wrists nice and straight. Your elbows should be close against your body, but not so tight that you've got them squeezed against your rib cage. I don't want it to look really rigid or negative. So again, that goes back to natural. Just let them fall, and you're gonna need to practice this without a horse, okay? Hands should be straight with thumbs on top and fingers closed. Keep a tight fist will actually, on that lead, will actually keep your arms more steady while bending your elbows. The best way to adjust your body position really is to practice without your horse. And when you do that, have somebody videotape you. Have your sister, your mother, grandparents, or set it on a barrel and videotape how you look in your body position so you can identify, am I leaning way too far forward? Are my shoulders collapsed? What's going on? It really is good to watch yourself. Shoulders back. Sure, some of you have heard that from your coaches. Really holding those cookie sheet will actually uh, naturally take your shoulders back and open up your chest. So really focus on that. Spine should be nice and tall, stretched up, not leaning forward and certainly not leaning backwards as you're moving through your transitions or your gates. Definitely don't slouch and we don't wanna get any over arch in your back. Coat your belly button to the, your spine. There should never be a twist in your hips. Make sure your hips are facing forward in any gait in any direction. Legs should have very, very, very slight bend in them just to make sure you keep balance and this will help you land nice and soft in your strides and when you're standing there during inspection. Don't lock your legs. Don't want somebody to pass out when they're doing inspection. Um, so just a little bit of bend. Toes should face forward. So while you're standing, you should be facing your horse at all times. Shoulders and toes, your toes face your horse's shoulders and toes. So let's talk through these pictures I've got here. Let's go through starting with the top left picture with the young lady in green. This exhibitor is really nicely dressed, well put together, halter looks like it's fitting great, and her horse is well turned out. 
I would prefer her to have her shoulders and hips facing more towards her horse's right eye rather than open to the arena and judge. I do like how the exhibitor would, or her eyes are intently on the judge. She looks focused. She's paying attention to the judge, which is certain cre certainly credit earning. I would like to see the exhibitor take a half step forward when she, that would allow her to soften through her elbow a little bit more. Ideally, when you're standing in this position at your horse, you should be a half a arm's length away from your horse's head. Um, I really like how, uh, again, she's got her horse set up nicely. Unfortunately, with just her stance today, I would give her a two. Now, taking that into consideration, obviously, I'd have to watch that whole maneuver. This is one giant little tiny snapshot of this particular maneuver, so we would have to watch the whole maneuver. But in that position, her arms are unlevel, shoulders aren't rolled back. That's what I'm going with today. Moving to the young lady on the right with the medicine hat obero, super intent on the judge, really standing tall, nicely dressed, horse is well turned out, halter fits well, horse is nicely square all the way around. I would like to see this exhibitor also take a tiny step forward so her arms aren't reaching and stretching so much. Uh, that would allow again that softer bend to her elbow and her arm, her forearm. So again, you should be about a half arm's length away from your horse's head. I would give this exhibitor a plus one and a half, super poised, love her smile. I can even tell that she's smiling and she's not even looking at us. Moving down to below the bay on the left, this exhibitor looks super classy, standing poised with nicely squared shoulders. I love her natural position of her arms. For that half point more to get to the plus three, she could drop her forearm just a smidgen and straighten out her wrist, but really beautiful presentation here um, would simply ensure that it, that wrist would just, pitting it down just a little bit would ensure that there's no pressure pulling upward on her horse's shank unintentionally. Confidence. Moving to the gentleman on the right with the bald face paint. He looks super sharp in his entire, well-groomed horse, beautiful and healthy, halter fits nicely. But unfortunately today, you can see that he hasn't set his horse square, indicated by that white arrow. So his right hind of that horse is not where it needs to be. I would also like to see the gentleman step a little bit, about a half step forward, so he can hold his arms more level and together. You'll notice a little bit of air between his right elbow, indicating that it's also a little bit too far away from his body. I would like to see his horse's neck bent straight, so it's bent a little bit off to the left. So unfortunately, today, given this tiny snapshot of this maneuver, he would have a negative three. All right, are there any questions I can answer here before I jump onto the patterns? I'm not watching the chat box. Yes, uh, Leanne, this is Kurt. Uh, there was a couple of questions here that, uh, um, can you address the, uh, the lead shank, the extra part of it? Uh, um, uh, we've had a couple of questions regarding that. And is the extra part as in the chain? No, no, the, uh, the uh, would be what you're holding in oh, your left hand. Yes, we're going to get to that a little bit later in, the, in the, pa the presentation. Thank you so much for all of you that are asking that. I'm going to tell you exactly how you need to hold it a little bit later on. Okay, and then uh, we can address one that because you've just uh, talked about it here, uh, an individual talking about the scorecard. Uh, he asked the question, what is to expect for judging when you are a junior? Um, is the score, so really the question comes down to, are the requirements or the scorecard, is that the same or is it a little bit different for all ages? That is a fantastic question. It really is the same. You're going to have to read your rule book, but there are some expectations that are a little bit more lenient when it comes to novice riders. And so for our rule book, we don't have any ex um, exemptions. You know, what the scorebook says is for all ages. When you get to another breed association, instead of, you know, knocking over a cone, you get disqualified, you're just going to move to the bottom of that judge's card. And so um, those are some things that you can really learn about in the rule book. Great question. One more to before you go on. Um, and it was asked earlier and an individual just asked it. 
what if the judge does not post that score sheet at the end of the show? That is such a fantastic question. I'm so glad to whoever asked that. I would really encourage going up to the show manager and just asking if that is something that they can start to recommend. It really holds the judges accountable as a judge. And it also is such a learning opportunity for you as an exhibitor. And so don't be afraid to go ask for it. You might not get it that show, but perhaps the next show, that show manager will be like, oh, you know what? You can learn from that. Let me try to work on that. And I think we'll save the rest for the end. Perfect. Uh, that I have so far. Excellent. All right, let's move on to the pattern here. First things first, you gotta be on pattern. You gotta have the correct maneuvers down. I know this sounds super ridiculous, but the ultimate goal in showmanship is to get your horse to set up and move freely on the pattern without being told to do so. It shows the communication you have with your horse and it's almost telepathic. Because a judge, I cannot see you moving a hand. I can hardly hear any audible noise coming from your mouth and it's super slick. Now, just for a second, hang in there with me. A lot of times what I do in a clinic or for my clients, I make them practice shankless showmanship. So these are a few pictures that I took from a clinic in Denmark that I hosted. And oftentimes this is perfect and you practice it without your lead rope. Just make sure you're in a safe area, confined, you're not gonna get your horse in trouble. So please disclaimer there. Um, but this is going to really, your horse is gonna tell on you right now. And it's going to tell you where you need work because the girl on the left, you can see that she's not, she doesn't have a, a, any sort of lead rope in her hand and her horse is still connected to her. It's following her, she is the leader. The horse on the right, unfortunately, has lost interest, doesn't really wanna be up there with her owner, um, isn't as obedient as the horse on the left. So don't, you know, you wanna get to where you're not telling your horse what to do, they are shadowing you and following you. You're dancing together. You are the leader, that horse is the follower. So back to the pattern, sorry, sidetracked. All right. I can, it can be quite impressive as a judge to watch an exhibitor trot, stop, back with lightning speed. However, when you start sacrificing correctness for speed and your horse begins to step out during a turn and you trip over your own feet, you're gonna start fall to the bottom of the court scorecard. While it may be difficult to feel really slow, especially with a green horse, it is crucial to be correct first in your maneuver with quality maneuvers and add the degree of difficulty with speed later. You and your horse need to be rhythmical and cadence, which we defined earlier. Being intentional and purposeful in each gate and designing that design in your pattern is critical. Your lines need to be straight, circles need to be round, and even corners need to be sharp. Pattern should be fluid and look smooth with a, your good precision and timing at all times. You need to execute smooth patterns where your horse gracefully stays in frame with a level head and pole connected to your correctly poised and confident body position moving to each gate. Maybe you move up a gate, maybe you do move down a gate. They should be prompt. Those transitions should be super smooth and take place exactly where they're supposed to in that pattern. If you notice the red star down to the left right here um, on that pattern, I'm sure some of you have seen this pattern where it says start at A. That can be super intimidating because I know I'm guilty of it too. I wanted to start way back when I first started doing showmanship because I wanted kind of a running start. Well, that's not allowed. Um, maybe when you're first getting your, your feet wet and you're, you're learning, that's okay. But if you want to get a higher score, we can't do that. So be at cone A. Not when you need three steps to get started on that trot, you need to have that trot right away. That doesn't mean you get three walk steps before you trot. That means the first step out, you need to launch into a purposeful, quality, balanced step trot. That means for you and your horse. To get your horse to read your body and not only your hand, you need to look for these effortless transitions, you need a nice guidance, but it takes practice and it takes hard work. 
but I know each one of you on here can do it. Everyone has a potential to make a pattern look effortless and the horse guide effortlessly. Everyone, it is not the quality or the expensiveness of your horse. Again, coming back to was it correct, that maneuver, what was the quality of that maneuver, and what was the degree of difficulty will really turn you back to your maneuver scores. This is something that used to happen a lot. It was kind of a trend. I'm sure some of you on this call have perhaps done it in the past where you're just did your pivot, you're leaving the judge, and you're trotting away, walking away, whichever, and you look back over your shoulder at the judge to kind of complete the run. It's, it's basically was your thank you for judging you for the day. Not happening anymore. Ultimately, that comes down to being a safety hazard. If you look over your shoulder and you trip, that's not gonna be pretty. So we don't do that anymore. It's not something us judges are looking for or should not be looking for. Um, I get that you wanna be courteous and nod to the judge, uh, but we are happy that you're here showing that day. So just know that you don't have to thank us anymore. Um, we are just awesomely excited that you're showing your horse that day and that's good enough for us. All right. Those pesky cones. All right, we got, we got to talk about these things. It is, I already mentioned, it's critical that um, we need to be on pattern. And so we need to plan out our pattern very specifically. Your line of departure and your maneuvers need to be crisp and clean. So this young lady, let's say she had to come straight down that line to that last cone there it needs to be straight, very straight. And so that's something that we need to make sure um, is happening. We don't want to have it be any sort of crooked craziness, okay? And so when you're straight, you're gonna get more credit earning. Let's talk about a little bit of body position. Where are your cones and how far away do you need to stay to those cones? The pattern here that I've designed shows a 90 degree turn at cone B, okay? That's the second cone coming down the page. If you have a 360 degree pivot right there, you're gonna need to make sure you stay well off the cone so you or your horse don't hit that cone. And so making sure that you know your pattern well in relation to the cones are key. You need to make sure that you have correct space. And so, First off, we're going to start with the shoulder at that cone, just looking at the pattern on this left. And in order to have a direct line of travel straight away, I need to stop my horse's hips at that cone to have that straight away pattern precision. If we focus on the right with that other horse, shoulders are at the cone ready to start the pattern. But if we sh stop our shoulders at the cone, when we rotate the hips on that hind quarter, we are not gonna be traveling straight away from cone B. So technically, our correctness, our quality has decreased, and our degree of difficulty has also decreased. So really making sure you plan out the pattern and really know your horse's body and how to execute proper maneuvers is, is very valuable. All right, what about the starting position? We're gonna look at some here in, in just a second, but when we're talking more about this quarter system in case it's confusing in, in, a, in a little bit, but we need to start our pattern set up correctly in the position. So that's before we even get the head nod from the judge to begin the pattern. So for example, if the judge is in quadrant four, so that's the purple judge, you as an exhibitor need to be in quadrant one. Okay, they're opposite of each other. As the judge, if you're the judge is in quadrant one, the pink one, pink judge, you would need to be in quadrant four. And we'll, again, we'll talk a little bit about this a little bit later to try to clear up any confusion. So you're at that, that start of your pattern, you're in your correct quadrant, what do you need to look like? So let's focus our attention back to the left because we need to know how to stand. All right, so over on the left, we've got this young lady with the white and black outfit. 
She's standing nice and tall, arms are level and soft, legs are together and softly bent. She's smiling, eyes are very much intended on the judge, waiting for the judge's approval to start. Always, always, always keep your eyes on the judge. You do not wanna miss the nod to go. It will appear as though you are not ready or prepared if you do. Once you get that head nod from the judge, then you look to the right here, this girl, now you can kind of see the front of her. You're gonna get in your correct lead position. As you begin, stay in form. That form never changes throughout the entire pattern. So here, this young lady, apparently number two, ideally her left arm here has started to drift in towards her belly button. She needs to keep that back out, um, elbows to her side. Directing your attention on the right side of the screen, we can properly see what the leading position is. You always want to lead from the left side of your horse with the shank, so that's the one closest to the chain. That shank needs to be in your right hand, and the tail of that needs to be in your left hand, as shown here. So she's grabbing right here in the shank, top right picture, and in the left, she's got her hand nicely coiled with that tail of that lead rope. The shank should never leave your right hand unless otherwise specified by specific instructions. For example, the judge asks you to show your horse's teeth. I don't know that that happens very often, but that would be one example you could take your hands off that lead line. Otherwise, you never, ever, ever change hands, okay? The hand should not be on the chain portion of the lead. We talked about that earlier. And looking back to the left, so let's go back over here, you can kind of see um, the young lady in the black and white, far left picture, that her hand is about eh, seven, six to seven inches off of her horse's head. So she's got her chain a little bit, and then she's got some leather a little bit in between her hand. Um, you may need to adjust that given your height as an exhibitor to your horse's head. If you're a small exhibitor, you might need a little bit more length um, between your hand and the nose. But the more you can put there, the more confident you're gonna look the hot and the more control you're actually gonna have of your horse. I know that sounds weird, but it's true. So you may need to adjust, adjust that. Note how the exhibitor back over here on the right, top picture, the correct picture, she's holding the tail of that lead in the top photo. It's ne neatly coiled, big loop, big loop I repeat, never coil that lead rope small, bad idea. If your horse spooks and that is small and it quickly, for some unknown reason, gets wrapped around your wrist, you're gonna have a problem and you probably will end up in the emergency room. So small coils are very dangerous. Make sure those loops are nice and tight. Keep your hands closed on that lead line and that will help you actually keep a secure posture. And she looks pretty nice with her horse. She's standing tall um, and you know, she looks pretty, pretty poised. Let's look at this bottom picture. Oh, so back to the top, sorry. You'll notice in terms of leading position, she's in a perfect leading position. She's halfway between the horse's eye and the horse's shoulder. So that's the perfect leading position. We don't wanna be behind like the, where, how she's actually positioned below. Down below, she is way too far back by the horse's shoulder. And she's gonna end up pushing that horse the entire time. And equally as important, you don't want the exhibitor to be way up ahead of your horse. We'll actually see that here in a little bit. All right, let's get through some maneuvers. You guys are doing great. Thanks for hanging in there with me. We got a lot to talk about, but this is awesome. We got walk, we got trot, we got extended trot, we got back, we got setup, we've got inspections, we got pivots and turns, and we, well, that's on there twice. We got back. Apparently, I thought that was important. It is. Oh, there's that pesky rule book again. Really going back to the rule book, knowing what is ideal. You'll actually see in your rule book what the judge is wanting you to do in your backs and pivots. It actually specifically states it in there. Imagine that. All right, got your footwork. Before I get too far into the maneuvers, I need you to think about your footwork. You got to preface your maneuvers discussion with how important footwork truly is. You have to pay attention to not only your footwork, but you have to know your horse's footwork. 
So make sure you close every maneuver. I know that sounds weird, but that basically means you're gonna finish every maneuver. You're gonna start it strong intentionally and finish strong with the same effort you started it with. So maybe you start out walking really fast in your pivot and then you slow down to complete it. You just lost all your rhythm and cadence. So you've gotta be consistent in your cadence and rhythm to have a correct maneuver, a quality maneuver, and then to get some degree of difficulty, you're gonna increase that speed. You'll see these three words often as you've already seen. So again, asking yourself, was it correct? What was the quality? What's the degree of difficulty? For an exhibitor, this might mean putting both feet solidly and confidently together in your stops, being balanced in your crossover so you're not tripping over yourself. Same for your horse, basically the same. You want your horse to stop squarely underneath himself when you're trotting and walking and turning and backing, all of them. You don't want to get too far forward or too far back with the horse's leg. So for example, let's take the back for an example. The back is in, let's say the back's in the middle of your pattern and you're supposed to do a pivot after your back. If you back your horse and you stop your back and your horse's back legs are very unevenly split, think about trying to have somebody turn you to the right when all your weight is still on your left foot. We can't do it, it'd be really uncoordinated. So make sure, that's what I mean when I say close your pattern. Get your horse back to a square footfall. If you have to take another half step to finish your back to make sure your horse's feet are square, do it. It's gonna make sure that your departure to your next maneuver is gonna look so much more pretty. You're gonna be able to step out in a rhythmical step. It's gonna be more cadence and it's gonna make that overall picture look nice, fluid, and smooth. All right, what about the walk? Let's talk about the walk. It needs to be you in your correct position, looking to the young lady in the left with the white um, shirt and the pretty black horse. Gorgeous form. As soon as you look at her, you're like, ooh la la, she's pretty. I really like her form, great smile. She's looking right at me. She looks confident, she looks poised. Um, I wanna take that horse home because he looks happy. Her hands are nice. Looks like she is not gonna have any cookies fall off her cookie sheet. Her, her, and her thumbs are up and closed, her hands are closed. Um, she looks like she's in very good step, just a really pretty picture. When we look at the young lady in the left, her arms aren't quite up to the quality of the young lady on the left. Are they correct? Mm, still not so much. If you notice her right hand, she's unintentionally pulling down on her horse's head. And so that's gonna give that horse mixed signals. So we need to be soft in our hands and they need to maintain the same position. The girl in the middle with the black blazer, you can actually see that chain is stretched forward. She is pulling her horse and secondly gives it away. You can look at her mouth. She looks like she's clicking at him. So she might have a little bit of trouble getting him to get that momentum and energy forward. Um, so working on that at home, unfortunately, that's going to reduce the quality and the correctness of that particular maneuver. Hands are also need to be closed and a little bit more level. Young lady on the right in the beautiful green, uh, really like how her, you can actually see this good length of chain here that shows me that she's pretty confident that it's not tight. Um, really like that with the young lady. Hands are fairly level. She's looking forward where she wants to go. I'd like her to stand up a little bit straight. She kind of looks like she's leaning a little forward, roll those shoulders back. To get that degree of difficulty up, 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 we need to have a good walk. That doesn't mean that you discount the walk. I know it's a slow gait, na na na. Just as important as every other gait on that pattern. Walk with purpose, get out there, go somewhere. That's gonna get your degree of difficulty up. If you're sluggish, if you lack consistency and you're not rhythmical, you're gonna not get a good score for that particular maneuver. You gotta have that style, gotta have that grace and that footwork. What about the trot? Oh, go back to just head position here. If you're a smaller exhibitor like this adorable young lady, that's okay. If we need to lower that head position on that horse, the judge is not gonna take away because that horse's head position isn't high where it normally would be. We get it. It's a smaller exhibitor. That horse is amazingly being obedient and dropping its head, perfectly acceptable. So don't worry if you're a shorter exhibitor and your horse's head has to be lower, that is perfectly fine.
but you'll notice this young lady is super sharp and poised in her position, great balance step. In fact, her horse and her are in exact step, left foot forward, followed by the right. Hands are great, shoulders are nice and straight and square, just looking really sharp. What about the trot? Same thing, you gotta be in that nice position. We focus on the left with the Palomino with the girl in red, great body connection. She actually has a drape in that little shank there. That is awesome, that shows me that that horse is connected to her body, not her hand. Thumbs are up, she could have that hand just a little bit closed. Eyes are up, shoulders are pretty square, looking good. We come to these middle two with the Appaloosa and the medicine hat here. We've got the Appaloosa, super beautiful horse, but unfortunately the young lady is a little bit ahead of her horse. So you'll notice she's too far ahead. And so it's consequently making her pull her horse along. Not ideal. Again, we want not that horse to just be following you. The young lady below, super sharp looking attire, looks very turned out, but her hands are stretched out like she's pushing her horse not ideal. She's a little too far back by the horse's shoulder. Young lady in this maroon color with the medicine hat, beautiful smile, looks really sharp, but unfortunately this lead shank gives it away. Her horse is not very happy and she is dragging her horse along, okay? So she would work on getting that horse to really follow her versus controlling it just with the hand. Lady on the right here in the black, um, getting her elbows in. Again, she's pulling her horse, arms aren't level. So really working on that form, nice energy in that trot and we need it to be consistent. What about the extended trot? This is where a lot of people I don't feel really gives it something big. We need to see a difference from your speed of your trot to your extended trot. If you wanna call it a jog, that's perfectly fine, extended jog. So Palomino paint on the left, looks willfully guided. She's got a really nice in her shank and her lead line here. Horse is very straight through its body, nice through its pull. Head is level, looks beautiful. Her hand, her left hand is drifted in towards her belly button a little bit, and I'd like to roll her shoulders back just a smidgen. Girl in the center, again, looks very willfully guided. Horse's head is straight, spine is straight. You can see right down that horse with its roach mane. Great smile but her elbows are getting a little wide. I can see quite a bit of daylight between there. So I would like her to not be rigid, but suck those uh, elbows in just a smidgen. Girl on the right in the pretty blue, um, beautiful red lipstick. Uh, it looks like she's actually pushing on her horse with her right hand. It's very extended. There's no more bend to her elbow in this particular picture and she's looking down. Something we need to make sure. But when we think extended trot, I want you to go somewhere. Give me some energy, give me some purpose. I wanna see extended strides to really get that degree of difficulty up. The back, we can't forget the back. Never, ever, ever, ever step in front of your horse. This is incredibly, incredibly dangerous. If that horse were to rear up or root its nose, it's gonna clobber you right in the face. So just never, ever, ever step in front of your horse. The ideal position, is left shoulder, your left shoulder aligned with your horse's left leg. Um, so the young lady to the left over here, she could be a little bit off to the left, a little bit, or her right, she would come to her right, um, but looks really nice. I really like how this horse is nice and straight um, from pole to tail. You don't wanna see the hip kicking out either direction, left or right, that puts a bend in the spine. You don't wanna see a bend in the neck. Neck needs to be straight. And uh, oftentimes I see a bend in the nose where they're pulling too much on the shank and it causes the nose to tilt to the left or right. We need to make sure that that is nice and straight. That starts with a very light touch. And I say that because horses naturally are, it's their instinct to oppose to pressure instead of yield to it. So backing your horse is a common maneuver in showmanship and you need to practice it often to be correct, straight, and to seem effortless without any resistance. On top of that, backing is sometimes hard for horses. So to build up their muscle, you wanna make sure that you practice this often. Definitely look up. You don't wanna look down at your horse's feet. You wanna look up and down their spine because that's gonna help you maneuver where your horse goes and have better control over your horse's body. If you're backing in a curve line, obviously you're gonna have a little bit of bend to your horse sometimes, so that's okay. Um, otherwise, 
we want to make sure that's nice and straight. You want to be quick in your back, but you want to be quality. You want and you want to be correct. So when I say athletic, that doesn't mean to rush it and look so crazy that you're backing. I've seen horses where they shove their horses back so quickly, their horse has to like scrounge to get their footwork right, and it looks like they're gonna sink into their hocks and fall over. That is not correct. There's no quality behind that. So on the other spectrum. One step at a time that's super slow, and it's like one, two, one, two. Well, that's correct. I can't give any, there's no fluidity. There's no to that. So you probably just maintain a zero maneuver score for that, which is okay. Close the back. Again, just what I was talking about earlier. You want to close, make sure that those feet finish fairly close together and not super open so you can move on and do your next maneuver nicely and promptly. The pivot. All right, this one can be kind of intimidating for some people, that's okay. It was intimidating for me when I first started too. You're in the same body position as the leading position, you just simply turn to face your horse's head. Super easy in terms of position, staying same position with everything else. You need to practice a rhythmical fluid footwork for your horse. Your horse should move off your body. I know I've said that many, many times, like a broken record, but move off your body, not your hand. You should never touch your horse to move away from you. Never, ever, ever touch your horse in showmanship. You should have some speed, but most importantly, you need some rhythm. Executing a turn slowly decreases the overall pattern, like fluidity, the flow. But executing a pattern too fast, you're gonna, you might sacrifice the accuracy and especially if you don't close that maneuver and because you're going too fast, you overturn or you're not realizing it and you actually shut down too soon, again, you're, you're going to actually incur a penalty, which we'll go over. So you got to be on pattern and close that pattern nicely. Preferably, you need your horse pivoting on the right hind, but it really doesn't matter. You can pivot on each one, but whatever foot it starts on, it has to stay on that foot. You cannot change pivot foots during the maneuver. So both are acceptable, preferably the right one. Okay, what's we got next? All right, stop position. We're almost through all the maneuvers. Hang in there with me. The stop. This young lady off to the left, um, you can see how much she's actually leaning back in her stop. Her left hand looks quite adorable in nice position, but because she's leaning back, this, this actual maneuver would be very negative. And consequently, her right hand is actually pulling her horse's face downwards um, unintentionally. So we really want to stop with our body nice, still, tall, just softening our knees and sinking into the ground. Same with your horse. The horse should be following you, not being told what to do. So let's walk through proper position in coming up to the judge. This is very critical. So this top left picture here, um, way too close. You are in my bubble, uh, very unsafe. If your horse were to jolt forward, it's gonna knock over the judge. So very unsafe, not acceptable. Moving to the right, the top picture on the right, still too close. I get it. You could probably squeeze through there, but if I, have, as a judge, need to take a step back, I am uncomfortable, not okay, still too close. Moving down to the bottom left one, this is getting a little bit better, but even here, you would have to, if I was holding a clipboard, I would probably have to suck it back to my chest in order to feel comfortable for you to move one way or the other. So not okay, not acceptable for me. Um, if you get there and that's where you end, take it, You're, it'll be okay. What we really, really want is over to the right. You should be an arms and a half length away from that judge. It's gonna give you the opportunity for the judge to feel safe and for you to be able to control your horse in a very safe manner. And so from there, that's where we wanna be. If we have an opportunity down here, back to the left, far left bottom picture with the sorrel, sometimes you'll run into a pattern where you actually have to stop the hips or the tail to the judge. So really making sure when you come up to that judge, you have to know your pattern. You have to be on par and execute that correctly. Otherwise you could end up a little to the left or a little to the right and you won't be straight set up 
with that judge. And so very important to know that pattern. You'll notice the distance. Again, you wanna create some distance here. Who cares if that judge has to walk? If that horse were to kick, it should not reach the judge. So just remember that. Do not get close enough that if that horse were to extend that leg, it could kick that judge. Think of the safety, very key. All right, setup. Setup comes after you stop. You wanna get those horses square. What on earth does that mean? You want all four feet nicely squared together. We look at this bay over here with the ears pretty forward on the left, same girl with the black and white. Very nice presentation. When we look at those feet, they're equal distance. Her front feet distance apart is the same distance apart from the, the hind feet. Horse is standing nice and square, dropping that line down through the shoulder, the knee, the cannon bone, and the foot. If we look at this lady, beautiful horse with black, her back feet are so close together. If this was a halter class, which this kind of goes back to that, you would not set a halter horse up with her feet that close together. So don't do it in an inspection. The young lady on the right with the Palomino paint, her front feet are set up close, but her hind feet are really wide. So we wanna make sure that those are even. Front should be the same width as the back feet should be. In terms of the bottom horse, well, she's got the front feet okay. You actually saw this picture earlier. She looks beautiful, but what's going on back in the hind end? We need to make sure that that left, in fact, here I would take the right foot, even though you're really supposed to move off of the right hind, everything moves from there. We need to move this horse back and get set up um, correctly and nice and square. All right. Set up an inspection, okay? This goes back to that quarter system really making sure that you know this. You've got these invisible lines that cross the withers and an invisible lines that goes and bisects straight through the head and tail. And so making sure that you know those quadrants and when you step across to acknowledge the judge as they walk around your horse, that you're in the correct quadrant. So for example, your judge walks around and he moves into quadrant true. The question here is where should you go? you should move into quadrant one as soon as they cross the withers. And so snappy, snappy, you need to be brisk in your movement, but you need to be there with grace and poise and look pretty, okay? So let's talk about that for a second. What about that car crossover? This is just a teach, see? Um, you can rewatch this again, it's being recorded in case you need to write that down. The crossover is just as important as any maneuver. Top left picture with the young lady with the Palapino paint. Really pretty steps, they're tiny steps. She looks graceful. She's still in position as she crosses over. The young lady below, she perhaps had a really smooth transition over, but she's got really big steps. The bigger step that you take in that crossover, the more possibility of tripping over your legs. So just be careful with that. Let's watch this young lady. All right, so she just set up her horse. Let's watch the, as the judge moves around. We're just watching her, not the horse. So her arms are really extended. I'd like her to soften her elbows, bring them back to her sides. She crosses over very pretty. Again, soften the elbows, bring them back to her sides. She steps with her outside leg. You can step with your inside leg first. It's whichever one you're confident with. There was an inside step. Again, arms a little too stretched, really want to soften. She needs to take a little bit step closer to a horse so she doesn't have to stretch out her arms. But love, love, love how she really watches that judge. Goes off into her back, nice and smooth. Looks really good. All right, so we get to the end and we put this all together. Be sure that your timing is perfect and those crossovers are good. As a judge, it's really easy to spot a team that has put in the practice for hours and hours. So horse and handler will have a really strong connection with rhythm. So you put the ease and confidence as you practice your pattern. So work on mastering those basics. The horse should lead, stop, back, turn, set up willfully, briskly in all maneuvers and with very little visible cueing or audible cueing. Definitely shine that smile of yours. This is a question I get. I know it's funny, but I've had this question before. What if my horse goes to the bathroom on pattern? It happens. It's okay. 
don't start pulling on your horse like this young lady is doing. Let him finish his business and then work through the rest of your pattern, but don't rush it. We're not gonna take off points because your horse is doing its business. All right, so this is the crazy part. So hang in there with me. We'll get to questions here in just a minute. We wanna go through these so you know what we're looking for. So the first thing is the break of gate. And so these are your three point penalties. These are the minors. And these are your first three point penalties all in the rule book. So let's watch Juan and see what that means. So she's gonna start off trotting. And even though she starts walking, the horse is still trotting. That is still a break of gait, okay? So one more time, and I know that this is blurry. That's okay, rewatch this. It won't be blurry when you watch the recording. All right, she walks and then the horse is still trotting. Not okay, you're gonna get a break of gait at the walk or jog for up to two strides. So that means anything under two strides. All right, next one, our over and under turning. We have to make sure that we don't overturn by an eighth of a turn. So if this red X is your start and stop mark, you need to start and stop, close that maneuver nicely, maintain that or else you're gonna get a penalty. Taking or hitting the cone. Well, that's not okay. We don't wanna walk on the cone. We don't wanna hit the cone. Juan does a very good job of uh, exemplifying this for us. It, you gotta know your distance away from the cone. This tells me that you don't know how to guide well. Sliding a pivot foot. This is gonna be really hard to see on Juan, so I'm gonna slow it down for you. But he has a pivot foot. He's chosen his left foot as his pivot foot, and it's gonna do a tiny little bit slide. So it legitimately just slides. And so we're gonna watch that again. I'm gonna put it in slow motion for you. So watching that right hind as he comes around, and I apologize if this is blurry for you, it'll be clear on the recording. He slides that foot back for an, an unfortunate three point penalty. Okay, so work on perfecting that pivot foot. This one's gonna be hard, but we're gonna watch it. Um, it's super fast. So this is lifting a pivot foot during a pivot or a setup and replacing it in the same place. Um, super thankful Kendra let me borrow this video of her. Her horse actually does both of these in the same maneuver. So she just is going into her turn. Watch that hind foot. It's gonna pick it up and put it down so quickly right there. So I'm gonna walk that back just a little bit. So watch it. Right hind foot is going to pick it up and set it back in the same spot. And it's super, super fast. So um, really making sure that you're watching that. Uh, that is a three point penalty. Now we're gonna watch her right front as she gets set up. So her right front, just focus on that right front leg. She says, go right front, bends forward and puts it right back. Whether it was a fly, I don't know. Unfortunately, we still have to count it as moving, lifting that pivot foot and putting it, or that, that foot during a setup and replacing it in the same spot. So um, really making sure uh, right there um, where she picks it up and puts it back in place. So unfortunately, three point penalty. All right, moving on to our fives. These are your major showmanship penalties. The first one, not performing a gate within 10 feet of the designated area. If you go beyond 10 feet, you clearly didn't recognize or memorize your pattern very well. So really making sure if that cone right there was where she was supposed to stop and she just keeps walking, most likely you forgot your pattern. That's okay, you can come back another day and try it again, but that is gonna get you a five point penalty. She's walked well beyond where her marker was and where she was supposed to stop. All right, break of gait for the walker jog for more than two strides. Um, and this can be a, a break of gate up or a break gate down. Maybe you're supposed to be walking and your horse breaks to a trot. That still is the same break of gate. Here Juan is actually trotting while he should be walking. And so you can see that Alyssa is walking and he is still trotting, not acceptable. That's gonna get you a five point penalty. Splitting the cone, the top picture here with Juan, Sometimes you see this in a pivot. 
She got too close to the cone, and so that cone is going to go between her and her horse. Not acceptable. Then you will also see this where they're actually on pattern, and watch that she actually, um, she purposely is doing this, so Lindsay did this on purpose, but she puts the cone between her and their horse as she bends around a corner. So walks completely over, didn't hit it, but she split the cone. Not, not okay. Horse stepping out of or moving hind end significantly. So this is just means that Juan isn't holding a pivot foot. He is trying his best and then he steps out. Unfortunately, you really need to work on maintaining that pivot foot. All right, stepping out after presentation. So you've nodded to the judge, you've told the judge, I am set, I am ready to go, and that darn horse steps out. So watch this horse's right front. Oh, let me go back. Sorry about that. Watch the horse's right front, and you'll see that he moves it. So she nods, ready to go, right front, doink, steps out. All right, watch it one more time. Ready to go, right front, steps out. That's going to get your five-point penalty. All right. Resting the foot or the hip shot, this is not acceptable. To me, this tells me that your horse um, is really tired, trying to be, you know, not obedient. Maybe it's a little nervous. Um, we need to have those feet nice and square. So if it's resting, you're going to get a five-point penalty. You'll notice that with the red arrow um, resting its foot. All right, so we did the three-point penalty, which is of an eighth of a turn. Now we've got the five-point penalty, which is up to a quarter of the turn. So we don't want any of those. Make sure you close and shut down right where you need to be on your pivots. All right, moving up to the tens. 10 point penalties here. Exhibit are not in the required position. That goes back to those quadrants that we were talking about when we were talking about where you need to be in relation to the judge. So you'll watch the judge walk around on this photo or this video. And as he crosses the, she, as she crosses the withers, Either the exhibitor not paying attention, either way, she forgets to move. She should have crossed over by now, and she doesn't cross over until she gets to the back. So now she's way too late. Should have crossed back. So out of position in the inspection, 10 point penalty. Touching the horse. Can't touch the horse, sorry. Can't use your foot to move his foot back. Can't lift it to put it in the correct spot. This is not halter. You cannot touch your horse. So sorry, you'll get a 10 point penalty. Standing directly in front of your horse. Again, we don't want to be directly in front of our horse. Um, so just make sure when you go to back, don't step right in front. Even if you got a cute little pony like Juan and he's tiny and you can see over him, not okay. Can't step in front of him. Loss of the lead shank. Um, this is going to get you a 10 point penalty too. This just means one hand loss. So you'll watch Alyssa and she drops the right hand. Um, whoops, lost it. 10 point penalty. If you hold on to the chain, if you put two hands on the shank, if you switch your hands, again, not acceptable. Any sort of severe disobedience, rearing, pawing, continually circling. The AQHA just added biting or sorry, APHA, so um, just make sure they're reading the rule book so you know what's not acceptable, but hopefully your horse isn't doing any of that. Disqualifications, failure to display your number. You have to go in there with your number. Um, otherwise, the judge doesn't know who you are. All right, loss of control of the horse, so it endangers the exhibitor. That's scary, we don't want that to happen. Horse becomes separated from the exhibitor, also scary. Don't want that to happen, but you're gonna get disqualified. Any sort of willful abuse, not acceptable. Um, I don't care how your horse has been misbehaving, whatnot, it's not always the horse's fault. Um, save that for another day, not at the show pin. Never know who's watching, you have to be an ambassador. Never performing a specific gait. If the pattern calls for a walk at the beginning of your pattern and you just start trotting right away and you never perform the walk, you never perform that specific gait. So you're going to get disqualified. 
excessive schooling or training of using use of artificial aids. Um, if this young lady in this picture were to constantly spank her horse to get her get him to trot off because he's not paying attention and she's having to pull on him the whole time, that's going to be considered as excessive schooling. Go home, practice, come back another time. Knocking the cone, not allowed to knock the cone. Lindsay purposely shows us that here, she kicks the cone. You should be at a good location, not even close to the cone, if that's something you even have to worry about. Any sort of illegal equipment, spurs are not okay, um, specifically disallowed in our rules for North Dakota 4-H. You're gonna trip over them, don't do it. All right, here's your last one for that spin. Don't overspin. Really mark and close that spin right where you need to be. All right. Um, this horse, we're going to watch walk through here and talk about this particular horse. Um, we watched him a little bit, but let's walk through. So I've got my maneuvers on the top, uh, her exhibitor number over here. We've got the pattern to the left. So be ready at cone A. So her horse's shoulder is right at cone A. Then she's going to trot, normal trot. She's gonna do a corner, nice sharp corner, extend the trot. I wanna see big, I wanna see you go somewhere. I wanna see an extension with purpose. She's gonna come to a nice stop. I wanna see it square. I wanna see it very intentional stop. Horse plants butt and ground not because it's being pulled, but because it's following your body. A really nice pivot to the right, 90 degree. A nice forward, purposeful walk. You're walking somewhere, it's not sluggish, it's not slow, very cadence and rhythmical. Nice and correct, it's got some quality to it. That degree of difficulty in that walk is gonna amp up because it's moving forward. Then you're gonna trot to the judge, you make that corner first. Look at that pattern, that could be deceiving. You might trot too soon. It wants you to walk a few steps before you trot. So really make sure you, you identify that. Then you move into that trot. You're gonna do a 450 degree turn right before the judge. Then you set up for inspection. After inspection, inspection you're gonna, when you're dismissed, you're gonna back. So let's walk through this. All right. Takes her a little bit to stop getting to that trot, one little step, but nice trot plus half. Little inconsistent in the top line. She does get some extension, but I'm not super impressed. I wanna see her go forward more. I give it an average. Horse drops out, moves its hip to the right in the stop. So not super impressed, but brings it back with a nice turn. Good walk, nice forward walk, love it. Shows purpose, she's in good form. Move, makes her corner at the walk, moves into the trot, stops at a really nice distance away from the judge, plus one. This is where we get that three point penalty. Same horse where he lifts it up and he puts it back in the same place. But otherwise, if I wanted to give it a plus one or a plus half, unfortunately, because of the maneuver, I have to move it down to just a zero. Setup was very quick, it was smooth. I really like what she's done there, plus one. You could maybe move it back down to a plus half just because of um, the closeness, a little bit closer up front. Still looks good. Her inspection is beautiful, but unfortunately that right front foot, as we noticed earlier in the video clip, picked it up, put it down in the same place. So that's where that three point penalty comes from. We move into the back. She steps up nice, horse seems willful, moves back smoothly and straight with some good cadence and some good rhythm. To get a higher degree of difficulty, she would step back a little bit more briskly and move her horse back a little bit quicker. Her overall form and effectiveness I have as a three. I can't give her much higher simply because she wasn't effective in the 450 or the inspection, had some penalties there. Um, total, so you've got your total overall penalties is six for a ending score of 73. Had she not gotten those penalties, she would have had a 79, which is a really great score. So great job uh, to Kendra and her horse, some things she needs to practice on. Because we're late in time, I'm not going to show this video. Um, I actually had that link in there. We can, I can post this link um, a little bit later. You can Google all of these and watch them. It's the judge's perspective. Awesome videos to learn from. 
So let's talk about you before we end this presentation. So for North Dakota, we have a very specific dress code. Go back and read your rule book for whatever your show you're going to and know, know what is required of you. For North Dakota, we need a long sleeved, solid white colored shirt. Dark blue denim or black jeans and a belt is required. Jeans must be untucked from the boots while competing. Hard soled boots with less than an eighth inch tread is required and that 4-H emblem must be worn on the left side of that shirt. Helmet's not required for the actual showmanship part, but it is required when you're mounted at all times. The exhibitor should have a basic knowledge of your project, so your horse, what is the age, um, breed, what is the ration, some of the general things that you're talking about, because you might come in there, you guys are all lined up down the line, everybody's done their particular pattern, and the judge wants to walk the line, and he wants to know, if you know your different, maybe you might stop and ask you a question. Those aren't completely off the wall and it could happen. Always, always, always keep a safe distance from other horses. You really need to protect yourself and your horse and other people. So make sure that you're not bumping into people and keeping a safe distance inside and outside the arena. You and your horse becomes unruly, remain calm, don't lose your temper and try to not get discouraged. You've got stuff to grow on. That is an awesome opportunity for you to remember. Just know that you are an mentor. People are watching you. So you are an ambassador to not only those that you're surrounded by, but an ambassador to the industry. And that's very important. This is a learning experience. Don't forget that. You're gonna have weaknesses. You're gonna fail. But if you don't fail, you don't know how to succeed. So congratulate other winners. It's a perfect opportunity to lose. It's a great opportunity to learn from your mistakes. And remember that you're a winner just by participating and enjoying and having fun. You really wanna be courteous and sportsmanlike at all times. All right, with that, I'll ask some questions. The picture on the left was actually me judging in Germany at the Paint Horse uh, World Championships over there with my exhibitor. Um, my, my ring steward, he was amazing. He's dressed wildly because they actually have a day where they um, come and represent their countries and get wildly crazy dressed up. It's so cool. And then on the right, I judge the Danish Paint Horse Championships. And so um, that's uh, one of my really good friends and her daughter. So let's answer some questions. Dr. Skirpe, I first wanna thank you for giving us all that valuable information uh, and uh, I know Kurt's got uh, several questions that he has recorded. Uh, and while you're doing that, I am going to post a link to a survey that we would like you guys to fill out and give us some feedback, as well as a link to where this um, presentation will be posted after tonight. So again, thank you, Dr. Skirpe, for uh, putting on this wonderful uh, showmanship clinic and turn uh, over to Kurt so he can ask questions. All right, thank you, Brian. And we're gonna go through some of these on a rapid fire for you, Dr. Scrape. All right. Uh, white straw hat or black felt hat, any preference? No, not either. Really the rule of thumb, that's a great question. I'm so glad somebody asked that, um, is time of year. Your black hats are during the winter because they're black, they're gonna keep your head warmer. Your white hats, felt ones, are going to be in the springtime because they're lighter, and your straw hats are for summer to keep you cooler. Okay, next question, and this goes way back uh, early on, and I'm going to read it the way, and it came from an individual by the name of Sherry. So I can use my Arabian halter and need to get a different halter for my Arabian to show 4-H. The chain is not the way you said it must be. That is a fantastic question. So... When you're showing 4-H, obviously it's going to go back to the breed ideals. So even in Arabians, they are very different and you need to show to your breed standards. So for example, you don't set up an Arabian with all square four feet. You're actually going to split those back feet. And so we need to remember as judges that your a beautiful Arabian is going to show to your breed standard. And so know your rules for that, but we do need a halter. Um, I think your halter will be appropriate because you're gonna stretch out and show up your horse. And so 
Um, again, knowing your breed standard is key. Great question. Okay. I am a junior in the junior age type division, and I have a Tennessee walking horse. What should I expect? Awesome. I love it. That is okay. Basically, when you move through those gates, we just need to make sure we're showing a change of pace. I love that question. Again, you got to show to your breed standard. That's what the beauty about 4-H is you can show any horse, whether it's registered or not. It gives youth in their industry to really get into the industry and try a breed out. So your walking horse, make sure when you're walking and it says walk, that you're going to do a nice walk. It's going to still be forward. When you trot, you're going to walk and you're going to extend that stride. When it says extended trot, you're going to move that horse out to get it to its Tennessee walking trot. So really just move your horse through its paces for your breed. Okay. Um, I'm going to the county fair and I'm going to show my horse, but uh, the, the horse show arena is right next to a race car arena oh, track. What, any tips on how I can uh, get my horse so he's comfortable with that extra noise that ha might happen to be going on? That is a fantastic question. So what you could do is pull up YouTube on some uh, speakers and blare that same noise at home practicing in the comfort of your own location. So you actually create that environment at home. That's one way. Or uh, you can get your horse used to ear plugs. There's different kinds or you can create your own. Um, or there's actually ear sounding uh, head masks. So they go on your horse's ears and drowned out that way. Um, those, a lot of horses, you have to get used to them, feeding them grain, putting in the, the little balls in their ears so they're distracted by the grain, they'll start to get used to them. Uh, so you can use sound equipment or get your horse used to it. That's probably the best way because you don't wanna have to always worry about putting earplugs in when you go to a distracted location. Get something loud, somebody out there with drums banging on them um, out at home, get your horse just really, uh, used to that scary stuff at home. Great question. Okay, um, go back to your scorecard. How many points do I start with? Do I get to start with uh, as I walk into the arena? That's a fantastic question. I mentioned that at the very beginning. And so always go back to your rule book to read it. And you start with a score of 70. So that, as soon as you're, you're walk that, take that first step, you've got a score of 70 and it's gonna go up or down based on your maneuvers. Okay, so f uh, just to follow that up, I'm in the arena and uh, I'm not really prepared. What do I really, what should I do if I get a lot wrong on my scorecard? That is perfectly okay. That's the beauty of showing. This is a time to come experience, take him, go mess up, make those mistakes, because that's where you learn how to do it better. Put that horse in a new environment. Who cares if you're not gonna have everything perfect for your first show? That's the fun opportunity. You get to go meet people. They're gonna help you if you're not sure. Uh, you know, ask somebody that's there to help you out and, and try to coach you through things if you're all by yourself. That's what's fun about the horse industry. People really want to help you get better and watch you succeed. So don't be afraid to reach out to somebody and ask for help when you're at a show. Um, there was a lot of discussion in the chat box about the lead rope and the extra in your left hand. Is it coiled? How big are the coils? How should I hold it? Um, so can you just take a couple of minutes to address that extra that again. Absolutely. So you really don't want small coils. The bigger the better. You don't want, if you got a really long lead rope, I would cut it down because especially if you sm have small hands like me, I don't want to have to hold a really thick set of, of tail. And so a couple loops is, is, is good and you want those big. And I would say, you know, no smaller than, you know, the size of a bowl. Uh, like that is getting too small because if something happens so quick, that can get wrapped around your hand and potentially pull your hand off. Mm -hmm. So be very careful, make them big um, and hold on to them tight. Okay, um, we're going into the arena and we've got our cones out there. So where should you stop your horse by the cone? In front of it, 
behind it or directly next to it? That's a great question. We kind of covered that. Go back to the slides when we talked about um, the pattern when you rewatch this. And if you're starting, the, you're gonna do start at the cone with your shoulder at the cone. If you're running a directly away, so you need to have a straight line leaving a cone and you're doing a pivot of some sort like I showed on that slide, you want the hip at the cone. So you don't wanna go far past it because if you go too far past the cone, you're not gonna do the pattern as drawn and execute a nice straight line away from the cone. So really make sure you know your pattern. Ask questions um, to the people that are around you if you're unsure. That way you can try to do your best during the pattern that day. Okay, let's, uh, the, we're into our pattern. And once we're moving, the question is, is how often should I look at the judge? So can you address that from when I'm performing the pattern and when I'm under inspection? That is a great, great question. The only time you're looking at the judge is maybe you're trying to identify where the position is. Uh, so when you're actually executing your pattern, you need to be watching where you're going. And so you might, if where the judge is, he's basically a cone. And so maybe you got to go around and stop right in front of him. So you might be looking every now and again to know where that judge is at, just so you know where to complete and finish a pattern or close a potential maneuver. That's where you're gonna look at him for that point. When it comes to inspection, you're gonna have all eyes on that judge. The more you look at him, it's kind of like an interview. You're, you're gonna be, the more you, if you were to look down, it's gonna show me that you're unsure, that you're not confident. So that's why you look up at that judge, maintain that eye contact. And then when you leave that maneuver, you're not gonna look at him again, unless for some reason he's another cone. So you're not gonna look back at him to complete your pattern. You're gonna keep your eyes forward on your pattern. Okay, I've got a couple of questions. Uh, I'm gonna combine these for you uh, regarding the preparation of my horse. My horse's tail is very long and he has a tendency to step on it. Mm -hmm. And then behind that, uh, is it okay if I braid, uh, put braids in the forelock and in, and in the tail? You know, there's no rules that say that you can standard. Um, let's go back to the tail being too long. Depending on your breed, it's going to be different. So take a quarter horse, for example. You really want to make sure that that tail is no longer than the fetlocks because when they back up, if they're longer than the fetlocks, if you're putting in a fake tail or something like that, make sure it shouldn't go or drop below the fetlocks. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question, and I'm going to double this one up on you is, okay, we are uh, got the horse set up and we're moving around in the quarters. How many steps, uh, first off, how many attempts should I make to get my horse to properly set up? And then once I've got it set up, how many steps should I as the exhibitor use to move from one side of the uh, animal to the other side? Wonderful question. So we really need to practice on setting our horses up at home because the quicker you get them set up, the more points you're gonna get. You really want something that's fast, not sacrificing correctness uh, or quality, but the degree of difficulty is gonna go up. If you practice at home, your horse is gonna get so used to it, know exactly what to do. So if it takes you five or six times, you might not get a, a good score on that, but that's okay. It gives you something to work on. As far as you as an exhibitor to get over to the other side, it's whatever makes it look pretty. Let's say you're a really tall exhibitor. Maybe you've got bigger steps. You might take one or two strides. Me, I'm really small. I have little feet. I might take five strides compared to your two strides. You just wanna make sure it's very graceful. You're not leaping to the other side, any big giant jumps. You are very balanced and graceful. Think about dancing across to the other side. Okay, now this, uh, the next few questions is uh, regarding some tips for training. Uh, what would you have suggest for getting my horse to trot? I just can't get him to trot. How would you suggest to help me out? That's a great question. I've had that problem too. 
you might need somebody to help you out for a little bit until your horse gets used to what on earth it's supposed to do. It's, it's hor the horse is confused. It might not be used to the pressure. And so have somebody help you get it started. Trot for a little bit of time, stop, praise him, pet on him, good job, do it again. Repeat until you don't have to use the outside pressure anymore of a, a smooch or something. You don't wanna scare the horse, don't throw rocks at him, don't actually hit him, um, and just you know, s encouragement. Encourage, encourage forward, give energy. Don't ever look back at your horse when you're trotting. That's the most common mistake. When you look back at your horse, you lose forward momentum. You keep your eyes forward, always moving forward, and that will actually help. But repetition, practice, I promise you can get it. Okay, now I'm my, I've got a different horse. He's kind of fast. How do I get him to slow down? Oh, I love that question. Again, comes back to practice. What I would do, you're going to get in really good shape, is just go ahead and trot some circles with him and let him know he's probably anxious, a little bit scared, not really sure what's going on. So go ahead and trot him around, or maybe you need to lunge him until he slows down willfully on his own, and he'll learn that maybe going so fast is way too much energy. And so practice that, try that out. Um, starting on a lunge line first, letting him get his energy out until he slows down. That could possibly work for you. Okay, last question that I have got on uh, tips is uh, just some tips on getting my horse to set up correctly. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's a really good question. So something we need to think about in a setup is where do you start? And so in a setup, ideally you start with the right hind foot and you're going to work your way around that. Um, so you are asking your horse to move everything around that right hind foot. So wherever you stop, if your horse stops with the right hind and the left hind is up, you're going to move the left hind back and move everything back to that right hand, right hind. What you're working on is getting something consistent. Horses learn by reputation. And so you'll start with that right hind and move the legs around that and the horse will start to pick it up and start to identify using the pressure. So if it's um, maybe you need to move the uh, a foot forward, you're going to pick very lightly up on the lead to move it up and let's say it's the right front, maybe up to the right. You need to move it up to the right, you're going to put pressure on the lead up and to the right. And so just really getting consistent with your cues is absolutely key. If you aren't consistent, the horse isn't going to learn what you want. Okay, now we need just a couple of definition uh, um, on a things. What is the difference between a trot and an extended trot? Oh, I love that question. So extended actually defines it for you. You're extending the stride. That doesn't mean that you take off running like crazy. That's not what an extended trot is. You're just opening up that stride, seeing how big that horse can reach and extend its stride. So you really should see a difference as a judge. I want to see a difference from your, your pace at your jog, the stride length there, compared to your extended trot, trot. You need to open up that stride. And in order to do that, you're going to have to get faster. The horse is going to have to get a little bit faster in his pace so he can really reach. Okay. Um, can you explain what is degree of difficulty? I love that question. Degree of difficulty is basically something that's challenging. So versus somebody that's just doing a nice, calm 360, they're going nice and slow, just to be correct. To amplify the degree of difficulty, I'm going to get quicker. I'm going to be more brisk in my pace and my footfalls to encourage my horse to actually step quicker and be more brisk in their footfalls. So the faster I go, not sacrificing correctness or quality is going to bring that degree of difficulty up. I'm going to get a higher score because it's harder to do. Okay. And the last question that I have, and maybe Paige has got a few more that I might have missed, but uh, somebody wrote in the chat, what does F and E mean? That's a great question. If you go back to the scoring um, slide on this, you'll actually see that it shows and reads as overall form and effectiveness. And that was on a scale of zero to five. 
I'm going to turn it over to Paige if you have some questions that I may have missed, Paige. I think you've done a really good job, Kurt. There's a few that just keep coming in. Um, I have an English horse that has a large stride. I have a hard time keeping up. Any advice? <laughs> oh, that's so awesome. Um, a good problem to have because English need to be faster. Uh, you know, because you don't want to take away the quality of that horse's gait because most likely if he's got a big stride, it's absolutely gorgeous. And so maybe you need to practice running yourself a little bit um, without the horse and kind of getting that. But in the same respect, you might need to slow him down just a little bit and use that tool of that beautiful big stride your horse wants to give in the extended trot. And so working at home to really start to find your balance purpose. I like energy in a gait. I don't really prefer something that's really, really slow because that's not challenging. And so I want to see something with purpose in it. And so just practice. You can certainly get it. I have full confidence in you. Okay, then there's a question about do judges prefer the pattern to be a little slower or a little faster? Now be careful with the fast term. It's a great question. You don't want to ever be fast. Um, I want to be still correct and have quality in my gates, but I want to have that degree of difficulty. So sometimes does that mean faster? Sure, it does. But I, anybody can go out there, like this is just an example. I take the walk, for example. My mom can go out there and walk, but I can go out there or encourage her to go out there and walk a little faster. I'm going to use your term to increase that degree of difficulty because you're going out there and you've got intention to your step. You've got a purpose to your step. You're going somewhere rather than just walking along side by side. Does that make sense? Another question, um, you may have addressed this, but are you required to use a lead shank or a chain because we were told we didn't have to and we keep getting docked? Oh, well, Again, go back and read your rules. And so, you know, every breed association, every show is different. And don't be afraid to ask so, show management because it potentially might not be in their rule book. And so for us 4-H, you don't have to, not required. Will you get docked in showmanship if your horse's mane and tail have been chewed on? <laughs> no, darn it anyways, I hope it grows back. Um, absolutely not. This is, I mean, you still want to try to make your horse presentable. So if it's super uneven, you might try to even it out and that'll help the regrowth anyways. Um, you can certainly roach the mane if you wanted to, too. That's acceptable. Uh, or you can braid it up, um, in, in little things and you might not be able to see that it's uneven. So, uh, just try to make it look as pretty again, well grooming and conditioning is certainly a part of inspection, but it's, you're not going to lose the entire competition just because some poor pony chewed on your horse's mane. Is a request to discuss English attire, if you can, briefly. Absolutely. Uh, again, you've got to go back to your rule book. Your rule book's going to specify exactly what is acceptable for English attire and what you need to wear, whether that's a certain color of breeches. Uh, sometimes they only allow certain colors. Uh, your tall boots, do they allow job purse? So go back and read your rule book because every rule book's a little bit different. What if your horse steps on you? <laughs> yeah, oh, that's not fun. Don't uh, try to keep your calm. Um, try to remain in a good position and don't yank your horse's face off. Uh, most likely he didn't mean to do it. Just make him step off your foot and depending on how much pain you're in, try to finish your pattern the best that you possibly can. All right, we'll answer a couple more questions and I think it's um, running out here, but do you get dog points if your horse is older and sway backed? No, this isn't a confirmation class. That's what's kind of cool about showmanship. It's open to all horses. And so if your horse can maneuver through the patterns, still nice and acceptable that I have discussed today with precision, smoothness, you're prompt in your transitions, you're going to get a good score. Um, really, it's about working through your pattern, not how your horse. Now, I take that with a grain of salt in terms of lameness. If your horse is lame, 
and they're older or they're not older, then that's where you're, you're unfortunately your gate isn't going to be pretty and you're going to get docked or potentially if it's bad enough, you'll be asked to leave. The question about miniature courses, they're shown in halves instead of quarters. Will I get a penalty if I do halves at 4-H? Uh, again, this is, a, a, I don't think, because again, you're going back to breed standards, but if you're talking about halves in terms of pattern, you still have to do be on pattern. If it says to do a 90, you still have to do a 90. Um, hopefully, unfortunately, they're, they're not going to reset the pattern to make it smaller for you at a show. Um, so you're going to have to ride the pattern just like everybody else rides it at a 4-H show. At your miniature show, it's going to be a little bit different because it's spe set specifically to your miniature horse but you're gonna to have to do the pattern exactly how all the other exhibitors are doing it. How do you fix a horse cocking their leg every time you set up? Oh man, that just goes to practice. Um, really working and making sure if they, if they do that, what I would do is go ahead and back them up, set them up and stand there for a while. I know it's boring, I know it's hard work, but just as you need to practice your own patience, your horse needs to work on their patience too, and that takes time. And what's the difference between halter and showmanship? Ah, that's a good question. Halter is based just on the confirmation of your horse. And so how well is your horse balanced? What is the structural correctness of your horse? What does the breeding sex characteristics look like and the muscling? And so very different. They don't have to do a pattern. Um, I think one of the last ones here. How do you start teaching a young horse to back, trot, pivot, etc.? Oh man, you just start at the basics. Again, horses move off of pressure and so you find what works for you. Everybody has their own methods, but being consistent in what you're doing is key and really trying to get to where your horse, you know, you don't really need any sort of push or pull. They're moving off your body and praise, 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 especially young horse only, especially let's take a pivot for example, Take one step where he crosses over nice, praise, praise, praise him. Give him a, a good, don't ask for a full pivot on a horse that's never done it before. You're, you're basically setting your horse up for them to succeed. I think we could keep asking you questions all night long, but uh, I think in the interest of time, maybe we'll wrap it up there. And right. if you exhibit or participants, if you have any additional questions, you can contact us at the email on the screen. Yes, thank you guys so much for joining tonight. It was so wonderful to have you. I'm um, super excited. Uh, Dr. Scope and the rest of the committee, I was keeping track here. At the high point, we had 156 participants that I caught. There was 23 states represented with, and I picked out 26 different counties from North Dakota. Wow, that's cool. So. Thank you, everyone. And uh, Brian, do you have, have any closing comments? No, I don't. I just want to thank Dr. Scarpe for her uh, information and wisdom tonight and sharing that with everyone tonight. Uh, did a great job. A lot of information was shared. Again, I posted the link uh, to where this presentation will be posted. Uh, it will be up in the next couple days after we have a chance to go through and uh, get it ready to go uh, uh, to go live. So. Again, thank you guys. Hope you have a great night.